um, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, this next thing that you're going to see, uh, this project that Latanya thought of and that we're, Patient Privacy Rights, is very proud to support. We are working together with Latanya and the Harvard uh, data, pri data Privacy Lab to uh, begin to map out where data flows. And I think uh, those of you that were here today and that were here a year ago know that the key problem for patients and for consumers is we don't know where our data is. We do not know. Raise your hand if you think you know, because we're going to employ you to help fill in the blanks for the datamap.org. Okay, so, uh, and it's patently unfair to ask people to balance risks and benefits when you have no idea what the risks are. It's patently unfair. I think Latani would say it's worse than that, it's impossible. <laughs> so, um, Latanya, of course, is the uh, privacy rock star in the computer science world, and um, I'm pleased to say she's uh, a very dear friend, and she's a, a recent new board member for Patient Privacy Rights. So, all of you who think I don't know enough about technology, <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a really great advisor now. So, um, Latanya, would you like to come up and, uh, and introduce the datamap.org? Thank you. Um, it's great to be here and, and also to see so many of you. Some of you with names I hadn't, I knew the names and not the faces. Some of you knew the faces, but your hair is a little older, <laughs> a little grayer, but it's all good. It's all great to see the, the old friends and make new ones as well. And thank you, Deb, for this opportunity. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Society has experienced exponential growth in the amount of data that's collected on individuals. And with so much data readily available, you might expect to see a litany of harms. But such cases seem really rare. So we could postulate why that's so, <clears throat> but one of the reasons is that there's a lack of transparency in data sharing arrangements, and hidden data sharing hides harms. Harms may be happening, but our current environment makes causes of harms difficult to detect. The goal is not to thwart data sharing or to stop it. The goal um, is to recognize that there are important benefits to society from data sharing. But we can't move forward responsibly without understanding what's really happening. So there were earlier reports of potential harms. In 1996, Linoz surveyed Fortune 500 companies, and about a third of them said that they, made, they used medical records to make hiring, firing, and promotion decisions. If so, we can ask ourselves, where did the employers get the information? In 1995, the New England Journal of Medicine published a reference to a case in which a banker crosses information with debtors at his bank with information on a cancer registry. And if there was a match, he would tweak the credit worthiness of the person. So is that really possible? And why are there no recent reports? Did we somehow solve the privacy problem and no one told us? Or do we make it too hard to tell? To give us insight, we turn to data maps, and we're not the first to do so. In 1997, Paul Clayton and other members on a committee at the National Research Council published a book that aimed to serve as guidelines for formulating the discussions that became known as the HIPAA Privacy Rule. This is a reproduction from their book. It depicts flows of patient information about a hypothetical but typical patient named Alice. It shows representative, not comprehensive, descriptions of flows of health information between organizations in a pre-HIPAA era based on ad hoc knowledge of committee members. The rose-colored lines show you data that are typically redacted, aggregated, or de-identified. It's a little hard to see, um, but notice that most of them are not, in fact, rose-colored. In 2010, eight years after the promulgation of the HIPAA privacy rule, I updated the map. The number of entities receiving information more than doubled. New additions include data, outcome, and disease management organizations, and more billing and offshore services. Entities that once received aggregate, temporary, or de-identified information now receive identifiable data. A good example is accreditation and quality assessment. So you can say, how do I know this? What's the source of my information? 
And the source is all of the numerous things that I've done over the last eight years at the Data Privacy Lab and as, a, and, and as an academic working in settings with patient information, including on legal cases, de-identification efforts, and re-identification of de-identified data. That's to say that each one of those lines has a footnote as to exactly what the source is. Now, the problem is, um, the first question we could say, well, so why is that so good other than the shock factor that a lot of data sharing is happening, what else are they really good for? And I would argue that they tell us where to look for potential risk of harms. Let me give you an example. This is the 1997 map again. And rec recall that those rose-colored lines depict, da uh, lines depict data that are typically redacted, aggregated, or de-identified in some way. So here's the, here's the employer. If we were to couple this map with the Linode study, it immediately brings into question the strength of the de-identification used if employers can make hiring, firing, and promotion decisions based on the data they receive. The 2010 map also identified new kinds of entities to which a typical patient would be unaware. Here are just a few. If a breach occurred at one of these companies and was reported widely in the press, the typical patient would have no reason to believe her data was held by that company or part of the breach. The 2010 map showed growth in data sharing, but it tells us other things too. For example, the biggest sources of data are from the nodes with the largest out degrees. That would be physicians and hospitals. This makes sense because they're easily identified and they're subject to regulation and they were the first to have technology. But hospital discharge and ambulatory care databases are big sources too, and they're not subject to HIPAA. And the typical patient has never even heard of them. And the data sharing is, um, is, is one of the, this is one of the largest sources or the second largest sources of providers of data. The 1997 and the 2010 maps were based on ad hoc knowledge. We need comprehensive maps. So what we're trying to launch today is the datamap.org project. It's a way to involve the public in reporting and vetting reports of personal data sharing. So here is a quick introduction. I realize that uh, it's hard to see, so I'm going to do a live demo and see if it works. Ah. Okay, so here we are at the datamap.org is the URL. And if you type in the URL and then you click on maps, you'll get to this page here, which shows us the current state of the map which will change over time as more, as more and more knowledge is gained. And if you just wanted to learn things from the map, you can, in fact, zoom in and zoom out and move it around to reposition for the best purpose. Every time you hit reload, it will um, give you a different display of the, of the data. And I can move nodes around so that I can try to display certain things. And there's a set of utilities to point out certain kinds of nodes, like loops, uh, like a loop that uh, would go around to the pharmacy and back to the doctor again or other things. If you click on any particular node, uh, what you can see over on the right is actually uh, all of the links to it. And then if you were to click on one of them, you can drill down and get more and more information. Uh, you can feel free to visit the site. Information and access to the maps that I've been showing you so far are also there as well. Oh, and if you want to participate, and we'll talk a little bit about what participation means, there's a sign up, provided I can do this. It takes coordination to talk and move my fingers at the same time. Uh, and, there, and that's where you would sign up. And so feel, for, feel free to do so. Let's see. Ah, that worked. So how does it work? Members of the public are going, members of the public sign up to be what are called data detectives. And so they basically report and vet reports of data sharing arrangements that they find online. So to sign up, all you need is an email address. The name is optional. And so once you've signed up as a data detective, you can submit a report that claims that there's a data sharing arrangement happening between two entities. But the report must include a URL that is publicly accessible. And the idea of the URL is that it provides evidence that, of the claim that you're making for the data sharing. Other data detectives are going to then vet it. 
So here's an example of contents of a publicly available URL. Uh, this is actual discharge data, purchasers of, of the hospital discharge data in the state of Texas. This is a PDF file. It has over 300 uh, recipients of hospital discharge data. It shows you how many quarters they received and how much they paid for it. And each of these rows in this chart would qualify as a single data sharing arrangement on the map. In this case, the entities are named entities rather than abstract, which is what I showed you before, and so that you can actually engage the material either at the detail level, where it names names, kind of thing like this data would provide, or at the abstract level, meaning that an insurance company received hospital discharge data. So there are lots of sources online. There are IPO filings, there's document and legal cases, banks, brokerage houses, and insurance companies have to have statements about information sharing that are publicly available. Online companies tend to have privacy notices, and so on and so on. So what we want to basically do is to simply take this low-hanging fruit, which is information that's publicly available, and begin to document it and put it in a way that we can make some use of it. So now we've got all these reports in there. How do we know what's good? How do we know somebody didn't just mess up our database by giving us a lot of false reports? So we call what's called the vetting game. And so data detectives play this game, and the way it works is very simple. If you're a data detective, we will give you a data report, which will be a, um, that there's an edge between these two nodes, and this is the URL that someone has claimed uh, supports this. Your job is to read the, go visit the URL and decide whether you accept it, uh, that it, do, it does represent, it's credible and it does represent the data sharing arrangement that's there. Reject it or you can pose a question that you have about it. So now then my job as the designer of the system is to figure out how good a data detective you are. And so the way I've done this is I've taken a few hundred, I've taken hundreds of reports that I know are good and I've made hundreds of reports that I know are bad. And then there are the reports that other people in the public are giving me. So when you're playing the game, you don't know whether I'm giving you a good report, a bad report, or one that I don't know. And if I give you a good report and you reject it, or if I give you a bad report and you accept it, then that tells me how to interpret your input. Um, for those of you who are in computer, computer science or statistics, these are, we, basically, you, we basically consider the, each data detective their own classifier. We end up with an ROC curve. You get an area under your ROC curve. The bigger your area, the better you are and the more reliable you would be. So Patient Privacy Rights Foundation um, is going to honor and help provide uh, incentives for participation. And we've, we surveyed several of the most successful of these kind of crowdsourcing ventures to figure out the kinds of, of, uh, the kinds of incentives that may work the best. And so what we believe will work the best is something that Patient Privacy Rights Foundation stepped up to the plate to offer, and that is the idea of data heroes. So each month, the uh, PPR will name a data hero of the month. And at the end of the year, their expenses will be paid to come to this conference next year to meet and talk with you. Um, and there will be a special track next year devoted to data detectives and the data map. What are their experiences? Who are the people who are willing to put in their time? What were the kinds of unusual things that happened? We also have a group of others who are willing to do deep dives on interesting uh, connections. That is, a report was made, it seemed really unusual. They're going to go and fly to various places and meet people and put faces to those lines. So I started this project about three years ago, and it was sort of dead almost as soon as I finished the map in 2010. People always found the maps interesting, but no one was willing to help fund it or launch it or anything like that until Dr. Pill picked it up and gave it life. So I thank you, Deb, for this, and I thank you for this opportunity, and you are my data hero. Thank you.